Okay, um, with that, I'm going to start the meeting. Um, my name is Kevin Mullen, Chair of the Board. Um, this afternoon, we're going to dispense with um, a couple things on the agenda and postpone them till tomorrow. So there will be no executive director's report or votes on minutes of meetings. And we're going to get right into the purpose of today's meeting, which was an email letter from Dr. Brumstead on September 23rd asking for um, reconsideration um, for um, some decisions made on the three network hospitals. And um, that is the primary purpose of this afternoon's meeting. Although I do want to bring up um, for everyone's consideration, because I see that there's a lot of other hospitals on the line, that um, the board uh, may also entertain today um, a motion on uh, that is the result of the September 19th memorandum that um, hospitals received from HRSA uh, outlining um, what the guidelines will be for um, the reimbursement from the federal government. And I know there are a lot of different interpretations of this HRSA guideline, and there hasn't been enough time for clarification yet. Um, but the board may entertain um, a motion to try to uh, circumvent any possibility of placing um, a hospital um, in the position of not feeling comfortable based on those guidelines. So that um, may also become a discussion today, uh, just so that everyone is aware of that. With that, um, I am going to turn the meeting over at the beginning to our general counsel to just outline um, why we're here and uh, what we're considering. So, Mike Barber. Thank you, Mr. Chair. For the record, my name is Mike Barber, General Counsel for the Board, and I just wanted to give a few introductory comments before you take up the University of Vermont Health Network's request to reconsider the approval of a split commercial rate for the network hospitals and the adjustment of Porter Hospitals FY 2021 budget. Um, and the first thing I wanted to make sure you understood is your authority to reconsider your hospital budget votes at this point. So there are no statutes or rules that specifically address reconsideration of these votes. However, administrative agencies such as the board are generally recognized as having authority to reconsider a determination where the matter is still within uh, the agency's jurisdiction. So there is a Vermont case, Nash versus Warren Zoning Board of Adjustment, that is on point. In that case, the Warren Zoning Board had voted to approve an application for a conditional use permit. However, at a subsequent meeting before a written decision was issued, an interested person presented additional evidence that led the zoning board to reconsider the application and deny it. Uh, the Vermont Supreme Court looked at the relevant statutes and concluded that the zoning board's decision was not final until the written decision was issued and the board could reopen the proceedings and reconsider its decision based on the new evidence. So with respect to hospital budgets, the statutes um, state that the written decision is the final appealable action. Since no written decisions have been issued, hospitals FY 2021 budgets are still within the board's jurisdiction and you can reconsider those votes either on motion of a hospital or if warranted on your own initiative. Um, there are recognized grounds for reconsidering decisions once they've been issued. However, in general, you have broad authority to examine the correctness of your decisions before they are final, which, as I said, at this point, they are not. Um, so before, so I just wanted to make sure you understood that, that authority piece. Uh, and before I turn it back over to you, Mr. Chair, I also wanted to say that, you know, if at any point in your discussion, you would like legal advice on the substantive issues raised by the request, I would suggest that you consider going into executive session for that. 
Um, under the open meetings law, you can go into an executive session to discuss confidential attorney client communications made for the purpose of providing professional legal services, provided that you've made a finding that premature general public knowledge of the communications would place the board at a substantial disadvantage. Um, you know, we don't do this a lot, but given the potential for an appeal, I think that standard would be met with respect to the issues raised in the request. So that is an option for you to consider. Uh, and with that, I'll turn it back over to you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mike. With that, I'm gonna ask if any board members have any specific questions for the general counsel at this time. Hearing none, um, next, I'm going to turn it over to um, Patrick Rooney. And Patrick um, has had a, a, a rough task that was placed on him. Uh, under the open meeting rules, um, we cannot uh, deliberate um, any place other than public on an issue like this. So what was asked was for board members to get questions um, that they might want to um, Patrick in anticipation of this meeting. And so it's going to be um, interesting to um, see what those questions were and what that information is. So Patrick. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Lori, if you could bring up the slide deck for us, please. Uh, I have to share that praise, uh, Mr. Chair, with uh, our team, Lori and Kate they did the lion's share of the work in pulling together um, the board's uh, questions yesterday in in ways that I'm quite honestly astounded by and the rapidity with which they did so. So we have to share that uh, praise across the team and as well as our collaborative work with the legal group over the last couple of days. Um, it certainly has been uh, quite an achievement that they've been able to put this all together and get this team going, as well as Abigail Connolly, who set this meeting up and got all of this information posted. So thank you to all of you for your uh, participation in this. Um, as the chair uh, recognized that um, with open meeting law, board members are not allowed to meet uh, in public or in, uh, 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 together outside of uh, public settings. So um, we did take each and every one of theirs, their questions to, to heart here to put together a slide deck with some supportive data. This is not a presentation uh, format here. It's more of a substantive uh, look at each and every one of those perspectives that the board uh, wanted to see to support the discussion here today. So board members, because this is in presentation, if you could please, as you work through your, um, your discussion, cite the slide number in the lower left-hand corner, and Lori will be driving the slide deck, and we will um, very rapidly move through um, those slides you, seem, you, you uh, deem pertinent to your discussion here today. So with that, Mr. Chair, I turn it back over to you. Thank you. Um, so I take it that your intent is not to uh, walk through all these at this point? No, it is not. Um, it would probably work better to navigate through the discussion and as board members um, see fit, we would be more than happy to bring up the slides that support their perspectives here. Okay. So with that, uh, Dr. Brumstead, if you could um, tell us who's going to be speaking today and Joanne, if you could swear them in. Um, I'm gonna be uh, uh, providing the uh, bulk of the uh, presentation, yeah, presentation, uh, and, yeah, presentation and comments. Somebody's not on comment. mute, somebody's not on mute. Thank you. Um, uh, and um, I'll um, uh, serve as uh, MC for our group. Um, uh, for the most part, I think at this point, if you want to um, swear folks in, you should swear me in, Dr. Steve Leffler, uh, president of uh, um, the uh, uh, UVM Medical Center. Anna Noonan, president of Central Vermont Medical Center, uh, and Jan Bertrand, uh, who's the CFO of Porter Medical Center. And she's standing in for Tom Thompson, uh, our interim president there, who uh, could not be present uh, today. 
Um, and again, uh, if I could have the board address questions to me, uh, and if they're specific to one of our affiliate organizations, I'll pass them out. Um, if there's uh, most of our staff are on if there's other questions that uh, are relevant to the finance team or uh, legal, uh, you can swear them in uh, before they give testimony. But I think if you do the four of us up front, you'll have the bulk of it, uh, Chair Mullen. Thank you, Dr. Bromstead. Joanne, if you could swear in the witnesses. Sure, I'd ask everyone to raise their right hands, please. And do you swear the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. I do. Thank so you. Uh, would you like me to begin uh, now? Yes, that would be great. Um, I also want to recognize that we have uh, uh, several of our uh, hospital CEO colleagues from around the state uh, and uh, very importantly uh, uh, members of our boards of trustees at the network level and for each of our affiliates uh, uh, on the line as well. And um, right up front, uh, I want it to be clear that um, uh, the way, and thank you, Mr. Barber, for laying out the two points that we would like reconsidered. Um, it, it needs to be known that with the bifurcated decision on um, uh, our allowed rate increases, uh, as CEO, I have to instruct our leadership teams to build plans and uh, budgets going forward only on the part of uh, that rate uh, increase um, that is um, uh, going forward. And we certainly can't be building plans going forward on um, uh, portions of a rate increase that could be rescinded uh, outside of uh, uh, our control. Um, and certainly nobody builds a house and puts the foundation on sand. Uh, hopefully it's on bedrock. Um, and I say that because this is all about having adequate resources to care for our patients and our communities. And this is both uh, in the near term to what I just said. And um, because the decisions of yesterday and today compound into the future, we're also talking about the long-term health of the state's academic medical center uh, and our two affiliates, Central Vermont uh, and Porter. And when we don't have adequate resources, uh, our people, the people that I'm incredibly proud to serve, are very altruistic, they're mission-driven, and our people will continue to try and meet the needs of all that come to us for care despite not having adequate resources. And in that situation, they get tired and frustrated. And I'm speaking from experience. I've seen this twice before in my career in Vermont, once at the very formation of Fletcher Allen Healthcare in the mid to late 90s, and the second time when the ill-conceived um, Renaissance project ran into difficulties and um, many of you may know the uh, traumas that occurred then. Our people trying to meet the mission get incredibly tired and frustrated without resources. Year over year, we've put hundreds of hours into conversations, good conversations with the Green Mountain Care Board staff. We've written budget narratives that are incredibly carefully crafted. We've had day-long presentations and answered many, many questions from uh, the public, um, the healthcare advocate, and all quarters. And we've gladly submitted answers to follow-up questions. And the past reductions in our budgets crafted honestly to meet the needs of the people that are coming to us for care, quite frankly, are incredibly disappointing and frustrating. And this boiled over in 2018 with the Green Mountain Care Board's decisions relative to the 2019 budget. Um, and uh, we stopped short of asking for formal reconsideration, but we did make our frustrations known. Um, 
And um, uh, that's what has uh, led us to today. It's really difficult to keep a leadership team motivated when year after year we produce honest budgets to do nothing more than to take care of uh, our patients and meet our missions to be uh, told that those budgets uh, are uh, not appropriate. Um, we build those budgets relying on rules that the Green Mountain Care Board sets, and you set those in advance. And every year we expect to have a robust debate. This is Vermont, the town meeting state. We expect to have a robust debate on how to best achieve our mutual missions, which are to meet the triple aim and in today's uh, environment, the quadruple aim. And we expect those debates to be based on facts, <clears throat> financial sound, financial principles, and math. And um, uh, these all are the core of a healthy regulatory process. Um, we also expect that exchange to take place as part of a process that is fair and predictable. And as I said in the letter uh, I sent to you last week, and I'm definitely not going to reiterate what's, uh, what's in that uh, letter, um, uh, we don't believe that this year's budget review process met that standard. And we're really asking for you to uh, reconsider your orders in two ways. I'll restate what uh, uh, Mr. Barber said. We ask that you remove the temporary nature of any portion of our commercial uh, rates and grant us a single rate representing the combined amount for each hospital. And second, approve Porter's budget as submitted so we can continue to support the Helen Porter Nursing Home which is a core part of the continuum of care for that community. Um, uh, by yet again cutting our necessary rate increases, um, this has made our hill that we have to climb to sustainability very, very steep, particularly on the back of a year where we're working through a global pandemic. However, um, granting these two requests, Mr. Barber stated them, I just stated them, will allow us to focus on what's most important to us, taking care of our patients and our people and our communities and meet our mission. So um, that's what I had to say, Mr. Chair, and I'm happy to answer any questions or farm questions out to any of our uh, three leaders. Uh, that are uh, sworn in with me. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Brumstead. So at this point, I'm gonna turn it over to uh, board questions. I'm gonna go in alphabetical order and call on different uh, board members because it's too hard to follow the uh, raising hand at times. So with that, I'm gonna to, going to start with uh, board member Holmes, Jessica. I actually don't have any questions at this time, but I may as other board members ask questions. Okay, thank you. You have to come back to me. <laughs> okay, um, so next will be board member Lunge, Robin. Uh, I was curious if uh, Dr. Brumstead could, or someone on his team could speak to the HRSA guidance and whether they're making, they have a rationale related to that request uh, in connection with their the bifurcated rate request for reconsideration. Um, uh, now I'm right out of the starting blocks uh, violating what I said and I'd ask our general counsel to uh, uh, to answer that. Uh, thank you board member yeah, Lund. Just sworn in. I so Chair Mullen just to be certain I raised my hand and took the oath when Joanne administered it earlier and uh, in uh, planning for this eventuality so I think I'm good. Okay thank you Eric. <laughs> You bet. Um, and thank you, board member Lunge. I understand that Jeff Tiemann from Vaz is going to be addressing the HRSA guidance. Uh, Vaz, I think, appropriately has been taking the lead on that issue for all of Vermont's hospitals. And uh, at risk of previewing it, I, 
at risk of um, you know spoiling the surprise, I think what you'll hear from him is that all hospitals, including those as part of the UVM Health Network, are concerned about the potential effect of the HRSA guidance, and we do believe that that provides yet another reason supporting our request that our rate not be bifurcated in the way that it currently is. Thank you, Eric. Other questions, yeah. Robin? Well, I I was looking for a little bit more legal analysis, but I can wait for Jeff if that if that's what you want to do, Kevin. So uh, I will but, follow your lead, Robin, whichever you prefer. Uh, I don't care. So <laughs> um, I was just looking to have a little bit more discussion about that. But how about we wait for Jeff? Okay. Do you have other questions not related um, to this? I don't at this moment, no. Okay, we're gonna go turn to board member Pelham, Tom. Uh, thank you, I, um, I'd like to make a request of Patrick um, to walk through slides one through 15, if he could. Um, I, uh, you know, part of the context for me here is the guidelines in the budget process at three and a half percent which is a number um, I embrace, um, especially from a perspective of affordability. Um, it is a, as I understand it, and I've actually recalculated it at one point, it is looking at a 15 or 20 year period from the mid nineties up to 2016 in terms of the gross state product of the state of Vermont. So it's kind of based in underlying Vermont um, economic concerns. And it's the uh, number that was embedded in the all-payer model agreement between us and the federal government. Um, I was happy to see that when we went through the QHP uh, rate review process that the average of both of MVP and Blue Cross Blue Shield combined was um, below three and a half percent. And uh, um, so, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, as a board member trying to struggle between some of the concerns that uh, Dr. Brumstead has raised, as well as rates that are affordable um, to Vermonters. And at this point, I don't think they are affordable. So there is uh, a remedial action uh, that's necessary. But I think that slides one through 15 uh, do provide some context for the issues that we're going to be d discussing today and i'd like patrick to go through them and point out the network hospital statistics um, as you go through them so pointing out uvm porter and and uh, central vermont um <clears throat> thank you mr chair thank you tom yes we will proceed through uh slides one through 15. um on slide two is a familiar look that we produce year over year showing the uh, result of the board's decision and net patient revenue annual percentage increases. Um, you will see on the far right, although it can be considered temporary at this time, the NPR increase for the system is 2.7% moving into budget year 2021, uh, following years of higher rates dating back through um, 2014. Here we have the requested or submitted and approved NPR FPP figures for budget year and fiscal year 2021. In the middle column, you will note the uh, differences in those figures from approved to submitted and also the approved change percentage <clears throat> and the approved change percentage post adjustments. So you will see that 2.68 figure in the bottom right hand corner rounded up comes to the 2.7% you saw on the previous slide. We also have a caveat at the bottom around the University of Vermont Medical Center that does show that just given the size of the medical center uh, on an annual basis that the approved growth would be about 0.4% without the substantial revenues um, being considered from the medical center. Um, of note is the difference here in the NPR in the middle column and in red showing that the board um, cut budgets from submitted to approved by about $17.5 million. So here we have the percentage of the 2020 budgets to submitted, um, the variance in the system totals. So we have about uh, $89.7 million in growth from the 2020 budgets to the 2021 budgets. And then on the far right-hand column, 
we have the percentages of that growth throughout the system. So it goes from as low as negative 22.6% with Rutland to 85.7%. And again, of the center column, the budget to budget dollar variance, that is the percentage of that variance. So of course, again, with the medical center being the size that it is, it will of course take the lion's share of the variance just being the um, size of the organization. Uh, here we have the variance between the approved budgets, FY20 and FY21. Um, FY22, 21 approved as it currently stands today, a very similar look. Um, and with some of the decisions that were reached, the medical centers um, variance went from 85% up to um, just shy of 94%. Uh, and Rutland's um, came down to 28% with the decisions that were reached a couple of weeks ago. And Patrick, if I can just intervene one half second, just to, to note about the scale in terms of NPR of the UVM Medical Center to all the rest of the hospitals. And it's about a 50-50 a split in terms of going back four or five years and looking at, at that ratio that the medical center as a percent of total NPR across all 14 hospitals is about 50% with the remaining 13 being the, the, the balancing 50%. That's correct. That needle doesn't move a whole lot on a year to year basis. Okay, so slide six again. <clears throat> Looking at the um, a few different data points here. This is based on the NPR commercial payer increase and decrease. So not considering Medicare and Medicaid in the equation. Um, again, as has been stated previously here, the medical center will obviously take the, the lion's share of the um, variance totals here from budget to um, submitted budget. And here's another familiar look that we produce every year. This um, always indicates what was submitted and approved. Of course, this year it's a little more um, complicated here with the COVID component that's been discussed throughout. Um, and the fact that there was an imposition of COVID rates as discussed earlier for some of the hospitals. Um, <clears throat> the result being um, the FY21 approved at 5.1% and COVID consisting of 0.5%. Um, here's another uh, component to this, the COVID rates that were approved by the board um, and the equivalent and the, the equivalent of that across the system at uh, just shy of $20 million and the dollar value impact on each of the hospitals who either requested and were approved for it or it was imposed upon by the board um, this is done off of the dollar values that were submitted by each individual hospital, understanding that that is different for each hospital. So you can see it's as low as 277,000 for Porter, all the way up to nine and a half million dollars for the medical center. Slide nine, please look. This is a historical look at operating margins. Uh, you will note that we left fiscal year 20 out of it, either from a budget perspective or projection perspective, there's still, um, financial activity yet to come. We did not feel it would be pertinent to um, include 2020 in it for obvious reasons. So historical look at actual audited financial statement, um, operating margins for each of Vermont's uh, 14 hospitals and then system totals at the end. Slide 10, please, Lori. Uh, similar look, but in margin percentage over the last uh, five years of uh, audited financial statements with an average on the right, this is slide 10, um, coming out to a, a five-year average of 2.6% across the hospitals. Obviously, this shows some of the um, financial duress that some of our state's hospitals uh, have been in um, over the past couple of years. Slide 11, please. Thank you. <clears throat> Um, this shows the um, requested margin for fiscal year 21 and the operating margin based on approval. I will caveat that this does not consider that the commensurate reductions in operating expenses that the board also orders when they reduce NPR or reduce rate. So you will see some hospitals here where it appears that they are in the negative. This is before any commensurate reductions. So moving forward, when final budgets are approved and submitted by the hospitals, those numbers will change. So don't take it for any more than it is. We did this simply to show um, the impact as it stands today on the hospital system based on the 
um, approvals by the board of fiscal year 2021 budgets. And these figures are subject to change for that operating margin view. Slide 12, please, Lori. <clears throat> so as I stated before, this is, a, this is an operating margin percentage look of the previous slide. The same caveat applies. It is more to add perspective to dis today's discussion than anything else. Again, those red numbers will change when hospitals go back and perform gap closure um, between what they submitted and what the uh, board approved for them with the commensurate reductions in operating expenses. Slide 13. Thank you, Lori. And we provide the same look for total margins as well. Uh, after all, non-operating uh, income is considered in that equation. The same caveat applies. There is still work to do on the operating expense side um, to align um, the budgets approved by the board with what the operations need to be for the coming year. And on slide 14, we provided a total margin percentage uh, in line with the previous three slides with these uh, applying caveat that we've discussed already. And slide 15, <clears throat> this is an update of the CRF awards. We put out requests in our monthly financial um, documents to the hospitals that if they could put a dollar amount of anticipated funding on the state um, relief funds that they please do so. The hospitals you see in the left hand column here were able to do that. Most others cited that they were not. And then on the right hand side, we have the awards uh, relief funds as um, discussed by uh, Secretary Smith on the 18th presentation to the um, to the board and at that time Porter's was not known to us but that figure has since come in so you can see the um, differential there and what was supplied versus what was realized and with that I will turn it back over to the board so, so um, Tom so Patrick, Patrick, if, if you could go back to um, I tried to write these down as you went by them if you could go back to slide four please there's four I want to look at for a minute here So um, if you look at this slide, what this says is that in the budget process for 2021, we had um, $89.7 million in requested NPR increases, correct? That is correct. And if you look right above that at the University of Vermont Medical Center, their request was $76.8 million, which was 85%, 85.7% of the total. That is correct. Next slide, please. So he, here is what we did um, uh, collectively for the board. We approved increases of 72 plus million dollars of that 67.5 million was for the University of Vermont Medical Center. And I'm not adding in Porter and uh, Central Vermont and one logically probably could, but I'm just focused on, on the biggest one. So that $67.5 million was 93.6% of all the NPR increases that we improved, correct? That is Before correct. Before you answer that, Patrick, um, I just wanna interject at some point, Tom, I'm assuming you're gonna tie this into a question for Dr. Brumstead? Um, yes, I will. Maybe not at, we, as we go through this slideshow, but I, um, you know, farther down the road, I definitely will. Um, only have two more slides. If you could go to slide nine. Well, Patrick, maybe you may wanna repeat that because the court reporter probably didn't get both of us talking at the same time. Oh, of course. Yes, um, board member Pelham's statement is correct regarding the 93.6% proportion of the budget to approved budget variance. Slide nine. So this profiles operating margin um, over a five-year period. And the, in the, the number in the lower right-hand corner, the $329 million is the total collective operating margin over that five-year period for the 13 hospitals, correct? Correct. And 295.7 million of that accrued to the University of Vermont Medical Center, correct? That is correct. And you don't have the math there, but if you looked at the amount accruing to the University of Vermont Medical Center over that five-year period, 
as the numerator and all Vermont hosp community hospitals uh, amount at 329 plus million as uh, the denominator, that would come to 89.9% of all of the operating margin across the entire system for five years. Correct? Well, I haven't done that math, but I would say it is the majority of the total of $329 million accumulated over the last five years. Um, and if you can uh, go to slide 15, please. Uh, but maybe it's not. Yes, this one. So down at the bottom, we see that um, uh, the CRF award as of 9 18 20 for the University of Vermont Medical Center is $31.9 million, correct? Correct. Now, did we factor that at all into our budget um, re review process? Or we were aware of, the, of a number, which was like 12.99, but did we somehow factor in that $31.9 million in, in, into the budget process for UVM Medical Center? We did not apply any of those relief funds coming from the state, given the unknown, uh, to what they could actually be once the state made their decision. So no, we did not for any of the hospitals. Okay, thank you. And I'll uh, ask my other questions later. Okay, I'm going to uh, move to board member Yusufer, Maureen. Uh, sure, let me get off mute. Um, so, you know, first, I guess, Excuse me, Maureen, at some point, uh, Chair Mullen, um, and not right now, I, you, you've got to float your meeting. I have to respond to um, Member Pelham's um, uh, uh, soliloquy there because it was just fraught with uh, incredible misstatements, misinterpretations and errors so I'll come back to that at some point well, actually dr. Brum said I'm going to give you the opportunity now I was hoping that um, member Pelham would phrase it something in, in order of a question to you to, to give you that opportunity but you may do so at this time okay in in all of that I you know in the flashing uh, numbers um, maybe mr. Rooney can go back to the slide that shows the margins over five years Um, yeah, I guess that's the one. When you um, look at um, uh, 15 and 16 for the UBM Medical Center, those numbers uh, are very close to what um, we predicted uh, in the CLN for the Miller Building that we would need to make sure that uh, we did not pass along the costs of that uh, building uh, to ratepayers, and we stuck with that. And then as you look at, I'm sure even Mr. Pelham will agree that uh, 75.6 million is um, uh, over twice as much as 31 uh, million. And you know that 31 million is less, it's right around uh, under a 3% margin. Um, academic medical centers, um, the, uh, that 3% 0.1% margin um, in uh, the 2.2% uh, margin in uh, academic medical centers puts it uh, in the lowest decile of academic medical centers. The message there is if you want an academic medical center in this state, it needs to be funded. The numbers are large because, as is accurately pointed out, um, the academic medical center is half of the UPS. Another point that I'd like to make that has consistently caused confusion is the conflating of the 3.5% in the all payer model with what many years ago was pulled out as an NPR cap of 3.5%. Yes, they're the same number, but in the all-payer model, that 3.5% is the collective result of the PMPM, the per capita trend that's applied. The CMS component was supposed to be 20 basis points less than the PMPM trend for Medicare Advantage. 
and um, Medicaid is what Medicaid is, and we were to solve for what was required of commercial payers. That's very different than at the beginning of this process, assuming that medical inflation was going to be 3.5%, and that should somehow guide the MPR growth. We showed very clearly, and anybody that follows healthcare finance knows that 3.5% is nowhere near real medical inflation. Um, it, because of the growth in pharmaceutical costs um, and what we've been struggling with, with um, uh, uh, staffing costs in rural America, um, we're blowing through that 3.5% um, year after year and the chronic under funding led, as we clearly said in our budget presentation, to an inordinately large increase request in uh, 21. It's to be able to help us to catch up to the un chronic underfunding of the state's academic uh, medical center. And um, I would refer you back to uh, slide 15 in our budget presentation that just shows the deterioration of margin. And um, you can't run an academic medical center without a 4% margin. Even a 4% margin uh, puts us in the lowest quartile. So I'll stop there. Sorry, I'm getting a little exercised. Thank you. Now we're going to move to member use for Maureen. Um, thanks. Um, Patrick, if you could go to slide 18. Uh, sorry, 17. Mm, no, okay, the one, the one that has the historical five year for operating margin in and um, now it's down further. The one that has the three year, three year, the hospitals and the historical data for five years, just um, UVM, CVMC, and Porter. Goes past, uh, is that it? Yeah, there we go. Okay, sorry, 19. Um, you know, first I want to say we, we know this is a budget, right? And, and, you know, as we know, everything, there are assumptions throughout the whole budget. And I'm sure that every year, um, you, as we do, do the best that you can for the information that you have. And what we have right now, though, is the benefit to look at the past performance and see what's actually transpired. And you specifically in your letter called out what the board has done over the past several years and what that has done to your financial um, position. And I want to look at the last four years of actuals because that's what we have is, is actuals for UVM and focus on the fact that for the last four years, you've exceeded your NPR every year. You've exceeded your budget uh, for uh, 2016, a million 156 to a million 126, 2017, a million 211 to a million 172, 2018, 1254 to 1209, 2019, 1273, 1254. But more importantly, you've also exceeded your operating margins for those four years um, with them. With, with, $30 million over in 2016, in 2017, another $20 million. In 2018, although you were higher on top line, you did fall short by $4 million on your operating margins, uh, meaning your expenses were outrunning your revenue, which is a problem that um, I see that the medical center has, and we can talk about your 21 budget on that as well. And then in 2019, again, you overran the top line by $19 million, and your bottom line fell short for it by $8 million. But cumulatively, over that time period, you were still up $36 million. So I beg to differ on saying that, um, that you have been significantly harmed by the past four years of decisions and the four-year actuals. You've beaten your numbers every year on the top line. 
Most years you do on the margins, but other years you don't, and that's because your expenses run out of hand. So um, just want to get a little bit of understanding on, you know, I just really want to be on the record so that it's clear because some of the things that have been written do not represent what I see as the facts. And you talked about fraught numbers and things like that. These are the facts. These are the financial figures. These are the numbers you represented and you exceed them every year. So we do have that hindsight when we look at the budget process. Um, so I just, I just want you to respond to how do we look at the fact that you exceed every year, top line, you're not able, you also exceed your expenses beyond that on the years that you haven't produced a higher operating margin. And cumulatively, you're up, um, up well over in the four years, and even if we trended in where 20 would have been, you still would be up. You know, um, I'm still uh, tracking with uh, our ultimate margin and that our rate increases um, have been inadequate to cover those expenses um, and create the margin irrespective of what the MPR result is. And I understand that we have a basic uh, disagreement on whether we can control those expenses or not. I would tell you based on experience that the vast majority of our expense, and we laid this out in, the, um, uh, in our budget presentation, is related to pharmaceutical cost growth. The only way to control that um, cost growth is through things that we would not do, which is withholding specialty drugs and very expensive medications and um, labor costs. And we have very recent um, examples of what happens when you try and manage labor costs within the rate increases that you've given us. And you know, if you want to deconstruct this uh, more uh, member Yusufer, um, I'd ask uh, Todd Keating or Mark Stanislaus, but the basic rule that, or the basic result that we're seeing is expenses are outgrowing what we've been allowed to put in to our rate increases to cover inflation. Well, that is very apparent in your 21 budget when we look at that because your 21 budget has a top line increase of $77 million. And half of that, $38 million of the $70 million, $77 million is the 8% commercial request that you asked. And your expenses are up $125 million. So yes, it's, it's apparent that your expenses are far outrunning. Um, and that's a major issue. When, when you kind of put that in perspective, that on a $38 million utilization increase, if you will, because your top line is up 77 million, half of that is is rate, half of the 77. So on a $38 million expense, you have $125 million. $38 million revenue, you have $125 million expense. So you know, when we get into, if we get into further discussion, if we open up um, discussing about your request, um, you know, to put into perspective, a 2% reduction in your commercial rate um, was worth $9 million. And that's on a billion five expense budget, $9 million on an expense budget that's growing $125 million on a $38 million top line revenue. Yeah, that's, that's very much out of line. And um, part of the reason you know, we're talking about this. But, you know, another option maybe you could discuss is, you know, in your budget, you talk about no Medicaid increase, um, very minor, minor Medicare increase, and therefore you have to, to make the math work, push all of this expense or onto the commercial rate payer, that 8%. And what's happening with that is that's pricing commercial users, commercial patients out of the market. So the commercial patients we already hear, many of them don't come for services because they can't afford it. So yes, we need to have healthcare accessible. We need to make sure that you have the services. 
um, at the hospital, but there's also a balance between what the commercial consumer has to pay and will pay and adding another 8%, which was the request that you had onto that, just prices many of them out of the market. So the question is, why aren't you, as the largest user of healthcare services in the state, working with trying to get more from the state, just accepting that you get zero and then pushing it all to the commercial payer? Um, well, um, a lot in uh, those comments. Um, we've all uh, over years talked about the cost shift and that actually is one place that I believe the Green Mountain Care Board and we are the same. I will point out that the despite um, the sub inflation um, uh, rate increases that you've allowed, those have not translated uh, into reduced premiums for rate payers in Vermont not once and if you look at what we requested because we've been underfunded in 21 we made this very clear if you look at that and average it over the prior uh, five years we're still um, uh, under four percent for our commercial rate increases and look at what's happened to um, the commercial premium increases over that same time period they're decoupled right now and uh, we've had that conversation uh, as well, but um, you know, look at it over five years. You're you're all throwing out numbers about trends um, and what's happening over time. Very appropriate. Our commercial rate increases, even with what is a big jump, are below four percent, and we are very sanguine about that in our presentation and in our. Um, uh, and in our uh, budget narrative that those are uncomfortable big jumps for us, for all three hospitals. But, um, you know, that is the result of underfunding. We have to catch up. You know what happens with uh, negative compounding in trends. You eventually need to either uh, catch up or you end up where we are with vastly deteriorating margins um, below what's going to allow us at, to generate or have access to capital. Yeah, I would say it still didn't really answer the question about why you are not pushing for higher Medicaid rates, but um, I do want to, uh, now is not necessarily the time to go through, through how the insurance reimbursements work, um, but we have brought this up every time the network shows a chart about what they believe is decoupling of the insurance rates and what you charge. And that is not in fact true. And we should review that because basically the insurance, Blue Cross Blue Shield, if you want, it's pretty simple. They pay out what the, the claims they receive and then they have about a seven and a half percent admin fee. So so that, that's basically what happens. They, they pay out the claims and they've lost money for the past several years and within their component, within their rate, there's much more than just the hospital rate. But I can tell you that the hospital component is coupled into the Blue Cross Blue Shield and MVP's rates and other insurance rates. And in fact, what we've approved here is higher than what they have in their budgets, which if their utilization and everything else were correct, that could cause an issue. But we should, we keep saying we should review that at a later time because they do use the rates from the hospital budgets and there are other things such as pharmaceuticals as you said and other costs you know i'm not trying to support you the way but the math there is is pretty simple they do lose money and we can show that so i think that would be a good thing for another meeting but just want to make sure that um you know we get also on the record that there, this is not a, a decoupling and yes a uh, whatever increase you have certainly can be a, a higher increase on a commercial rate based on federal issue, federal taxes, and sometimes it's lower too. So um, it, it certainly was lower than 8% next year, which is the commercial rate you requested. So, you know, that, that might show how it's not, you know, one and the same. But um, I'm, I'm all set for now, Kevin. Thanks. 
Um, uh, Chair Mullen, if I might um, ask um, Rick Vincent, CFO at the Academic Medical Center to uh, respond. I'm not sure, uh, Rick, if you raised your right hand or not when we were sworn in. Uh, Joanne, if you could uh, swear Rick in. Okay. Would you raise your right hand, please? Do you swear the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. Thank you. I guess the, the point I just wanted to make when we're looking at the, the margin, the operating margins here, which is what we tried to point out in our presentation, is what's embedded in there and what we try to decouple is the impact of our 340B programs on the operating margin. And when you pull that out of there, it's very, it becomes much clearer the fact that the commercial rates have not kept up with uh, with expenses. And I think that's the that's the one thing that's lost when we look at these numbers at this level here that uh, we tried we tried very hard to kind of show uh, why you know the the impact is essentially embedded within our budgets that when you take that 340b related uh, business out of our uh, out of our numbers we essentially started to lose money um, last year Okay, um, Dr. Brumstead, uh, I, I don't have a lot of questions. I think that the, the rec stands for itself throughout the whole budget process. I do have one though, because um, I was troubled by the narrative that seems to be coming out of one of the parties to this appeal, which is Porter. And um, are you aware that um, even after the reduction and even after um, what you've aligned out as an anticipated uh, transfer that it's still close to a 2% operating margin for that hospital? Um, uh, Jen Bertrand, do you want to uh, respond to that? Yes, uh, this is the perfect slide. Can you hear me okay? I can. Yes. Perfect. So I, I do want to speak to that a little bit and correlate this to what's necessary in terms of support as well as funding for capital needs. Um, so yes, although the margin does reflect 2% from the operating standpoint, that 1.9 million that you see there significantly actually underfunds what's available for capital. And I'm not sure if you're familiar with the survive, sustain, and thrive model, uh, but the appropriate reinvestment to sustain is 120% of depreciation and to thrive is 140% of depreciation. And with these two numbers that you see here, whether we take the operating margin dollars or the total margin dollars there, it does not cover at the 100% of our capital request and budget for 2021. And so the majority of that goes to those capital needs inclusive of other things that we've spoken of, obviously, in terms of population health and whatnot. Um, but I did want to point that out because operate, or excuse me, our capital budget that we've requested is $2.8 million with Helen Porter included. Um, so we're already going to be digging into savings, so to speak, in order to fund the capital needs of this organization. And just one other point, um, when we ran the recalculation of our current age of plant, we're almost to uh, 15 years at this point as well. So Jen, um, Dr. Brumstead made a case why an academic medical center uh, needs to receive um, a higher margin, but Porter is not an academic medical center. And if you take a look at the operating margins for your peers around the state, most people recognize this as a very trying year. And um, the submissions and the approvals were significantly lower than anything that uh, Porter put in. In fact, Porter asked for the largest uh, in the entire state. What do you say to that? Are they just all budgeting incorrectly? Uh, well, well, I certainly wouldn't say that. It, each organization is going to budget to the needs of their um, respective hospital's needs. I think for our particular needs and what we need to fund Helen Porter. That's why the hospital's operating margin does look so high. 
Um, and again, when we bring that operating margin into context with Helen Porter and that support of Helen Porter, it does bring that operating margin down to um, as submitted to one half percent, but where it stands currently at two percent. Um, and, and we've talked about the, the need of keeping Helen Porter in the community and what that delivers in terms of a reduced total cost of care. And I think that's important in this. Um, and there's a lot of organizations in our hospital network in Vermont that funds services, um, many services within our communities and supports those services through subsidies. And whether that is um, services such as palliative care, which are housed within our hospital budget submission, or things like Helen Porter, or even, uh, you know, days cash on hand is supported by the parent corporation and, and provided to some of the hospitals that are reporting. Um, I think it's important to look at the breadth of services that we are there, uh, that are out there. And one of ours is obviously Helen Porter and that support of Helen Porter. I hope that answers your question, Chair Mullen. Thank you, Jen. I'm going to open it back up to uh, board members if they have any follow-up questions. Kevin, this is Robin. I have a follow-up uh, related to the Porter. Go That's ahead. On topic. Um, hey, Jen. Um, thanks for joining us. Uh, are does Helen Porter accept Medicaid? Yes, actually, the payer mix for Helen Porter Medicaid right now is about seventy percent. Thank you. And have you contacted the Division of Rate Setting about the, the Medicaid rates for Helen Porter? We're constantly in communication in terms of our relationship um, through our, our, our cost report preparing consultants. Uh, I will throw that copy out, out there, but we do try to communicate with them and have the rates adjusted dependent on um, there are certain factors that go into that rate. There has been improvements to the rates over the last, uh, I will say year, it began in July of last year. However, to put some things in context, uh, the total expense per day for Helen Porter is around $410 per day to care for the patients there. The Medicaid reimbursement rate, even with that increase, is approximately $295. So you can see it's still quite a bit upside down in terms of the reimbursement, but there have been strides in the last year. Thank you. Um, are you familiar with Medicaid's ability to provide extraordinary relief when a nursing home is in trouble? Yes. yes. Uh, I would assume because of the subsidy, Helen Porter has not been eligible for that Medicaid extraordinarily, extraordinary relief. Uh, we have not tapped into that um, funding with the exception of this year due to COVID, we did begin that process. Okay, thank you. As a follow-up uh, to Robin's line of questions, Jen, are you familiar that Helen Porter, according to the published rates on the uh, um, department's uh, website, has the fourth highest reimbursement rate in the state? Oh, that's interesting. Uh, no, I was not aware of that, candidly. Okay. Again, though, I will point out that that could be also with the way they determine the rate and knowing that Helen Porter is a five-star nursing home. And so when they calculate that rate, there's uh, expense that drives that, that rate of reimbursement. Okay. Other board members? Hearing none at this point in time, I'm going to turn it over to the healthcare advocate for questions of the witnesses. Mike Fisher. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I want to be honest, I have more of a statement um, than a question, though I would be happy to uh, ask Dr. Brumstead to respond to, if he has any response to it. Proceed. Thank you. Um, so first off, I think, uh, uh, the HCA stands by our August 31st comments submitted to the board about the hospital budget process. There's no reason for me to repeat the details of those comments, but I also think it's important um, for some of the concepts to be said out loud in this forum. Um, whether measured by unemployment, business contraction, lost income, or the costs of basic necessities, Vermonters are facing unprecedented, unprecedented financial hardship. Simply put, Vermonters 
just can't afford increases in the cost of care. This was true before the COVID pandemic, um, but during the COVID pandemic, it's true in an even more acute way. I hear the frustration expressed uh, by Dr. Brumstead and by UVMMC. I guess I want to express the same level of passion and frustration on the part of Vermonters who need care or who are afraid that what will happen to them if they need care and they can't afford to meet their basic needs. I'm not commenting here about the specifics of the UVMMC budget proposal uh, as to whether it's needed or appropriate. We can't possibly evaluate the level of details that would be necessary of their budget or their business practices. Um, I'm simply wanting to express in as strong a way as possible uh, that the, the impact of big rate increases, of, of commercial rate increases, as has been said by other by members of the board, um, is that it prices people out of the ability to get care. We all know that the healthcare marketplace doesn't function like any other marketplace. Even before the third party payer dynamic, I can't decide if I want to get the care I need like I can decide if I need a new lawnmower. Consumers don't have a choice. I know it's complicated, and I know what I know. I, I hear, hear very clearly the cost drivers of drugs and paying for staff that are outside of the control of UVM and, and of every other hospital. Um, but simply put, we have to uh, continue to put as much downward pressure on the rise in the uh, rate of, of growth of the cost of health care. Um, and just to say it one last time, because I just think it's really very important, um, the bottom line for the consumer advocate is that Vermonters can't afford it. Uh, the, the impact of big rate increases is more and more people are priced out of the ability to get the care they need. Thank you. Dr. Bromstead, do you have anything to in response? Um, my only uh, response to Mr. Fisher's uh, uh, comments that uh, by and large uh, I agree with is that it's also a time of unprecedented dependence on access to care. We are in the midst of uh, a global pandemic. Uh, it's not over. Um, you know, I will say this been this has been a wide ranging conversation and um, uh, I would say that um, we all collectively have um, and in different ways with different opinions put our um, stock in the all pair model to try and um, uh, wend our way through this um, uh, incredible uh, time of escalating uh, health care costs and needs. I'm still an absolute uh, believer in uh, a model where we move to the providers being accountable for the quality and the cost of services. I would say that the cost of those services need to be covered because the only way to um, uh, solve the equation if the costs aren't covered is to restrict access. And um, that uh, just doesn't work for any of us. And Chair Mullen, if I might, again, this has been a wide ranging conversation. I apologize that I got uh, a little bit uh, exercised uh, and uh, heated, but I would like to have you come back to our very specific two requests. And we can debate about taking the Academic Medical Center from eight to six is a problem or not. But I'm just telling you that uh, from my uh, perch as CEO and the decisions that I need to make, the bifurcation of the allowed increase into a piece that is uh, potentially uh, can be uh, rescinded um, is uh, presents a great difficulty. We just can't plan about around that and definitely uh, those that uh, judge our financial health, the bond rating agencies, 
having been with them the last 10 years and knowing the analysts that are on our accounts, I can guarantee you that they, other two that haven't downgraded us uh, will if um, uh, we don't have um, uh, stability in uh, what our uh, rate increases are. So I'll leave it there, Chair Mullen. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Brumstead. And I will remind the board that um, as uh, Council Barber laid out, there are two um, requests in the motion that is currently before us that are asking for reconsideration. And that is to um, not have the rates be bifurcated and uh, specific uh, uh, ask when it comes to Porter Medical Center's rates. So um, is there further questions from the board? If not, I'm gonna open it up to public comment and I'm gonna start with Jeff Tiemann since uh, he was offered by Dr. Brumstead as someone who wished to uh, make a public comment. Thank you, Chair Mullen. Um, I think it was actually Eric Miller um, who, who offered that, um, but so I'm gonna make <laughs> sort of a two part public comment. The first, relating to the question that came up from Robin about the HRSA guidance, um, and then a more broad public comment, if that's okay, Mr. Chair. That is fine. Okay, so with regard to the HRSA guidance, I don't have a detailed or formal legal analysis of that, but it is with certainty it's blurry. Um, so much so that the American Hospital Association has asked for clarification on several components around reporting timing, um, and how relief funds received will be reviewed. Um, I think from an association standpoint, we're concerned that um, a state government board that labels a separate commercial rate um, as a COVID-19 rate could be perceived by the federal government as a form of new assistance and potentially therefore clawed back. Um, so we would request or, or ask the board to consider applying one rate to clarify that this is a hospital budget process um, and not, not a COVID-related relief process. Um, I think in general, the requirements um, in the HRSA guidance are complicated and they're still being reviewed and the AHA is actually seeking clarification. So it just seems like a regulatory risk space that we should avoid right now. Um, and it's our view that your decisions um, today should not add to the complexity that already exists here. And I think we know that there's plenty. Um, more broadly, I just wanna offer a comment in support of the network's request for this reconsideration. When this budget process began, my plea to the board was to make sure our entire system of hospitals is strong, to make sure that Vermont's high rankings for quality and cost and access continue at their current rates, and most urgently, as Dr. Brumstead pointed out, to make sure we can continue to have the resources and wherewithal we need to manage the pandemic. Um, as you know very well, our academic medical center is a major resource for our healthcare community and the entire state, not just during the pandemic, but always. Board member Holmes said it well during deliberations on UVMMC's budget. They train the next generation of doctors while also resourcing our entire state and patients all over Vermont in numerous other ways. Just one current example is the crucial role they play in helping us procure PPE and testing supplies. Um, every day for the past several days, and I check every single morning, Vermont is the only green state on the COVID Act Now warning map. Um, should there be a surge, and there is always that possibility, we need this resource and our entire hospital community to be strong and ready. Um, for that reason, it just makes solid sense to me that we would not threaten our capacity or our ability to treat patients and manage this public health crisis in any way, including by cutting hospital budgets without a clear or compelling rationale. So given the information that has been presented today and shared by Dr. Brumstead and his team, um, I, I urge you to, to protect our shared interest in serving Vermonters with our healthcare system and doing so effectively and efficiently, and to everyone's point, as affordably as possible, and we're doing that work too. So with that in mind, I would encourage you to reconsider these budget decisions um, because I think it would be really unfortunate for any of us to have to come back here in a few months or a year and wish that we had managed this differently. Thanks. Just to be clear, Jeff, isn't it necessary if we're going to um, solve this problem that was created by this memo that came out a weekend ago from uh, HRSA, that it really should be for every single hospital in the state of Vermont that was given uh, a bifurcated rate? 
Uh, yes, Mr. Chair, that would certainly be our view. And for the reasons that Dr. Brumstead articulated around, around certainty and sort of administrative and logistical confusion. Thank you, Jeff. Other members of the public? I see a hand up from Claudio Fort. Claudio? Can you hear me? We can. Yeah, thank you, Chair Mullen and uh, members of the Green Mountain Care Board. I'm uh, Claudio Fort, uh, President and CEO of Rutland Regional Medical Center. Rutland Regional is a 144 bed independent, nonprofit, full service community hospital and the second largest hospital in Vermont. I share the concerns expressed by Dr. Brumstead and his colleagues about the Green Mountain Care Board's commercial rate decisions. For four of the five previous fiscal years, Rutland Regional Medical Center's operating margin performance has been significantly lower than budget. For the five-year period from fiscal 2015 through fiscal 2019, Rutland Regional averaged less than a 1.75% operating margin. And for each of the previous two years, we generated less than one half of 1% of net operating income. For our current fiscal year, Rutland Regional took significant and painful pressures measures to reduce our operating expenses due to our historic financial difficulties and the long-term cha changes in capacity and volumes that we predict will be the new normal in the post-COVID world. Over this past summer, we permanently laid off 45 of our colleagues and implemented other difficult cost reduction measures to reduce our operating expenses by almost $13 million. The intent of these reductions was to minimize the impact to clinical staff and frontline workers. Uh, therefore, most of these cuts came from administrative and support positions. Despite these financial challenges, Rutland Regional has submitted budgets in full compliance with the budget guidance directives of the board. Despite these financial challenges, over the five-year period from fiscal 2016 through fiscal 2020, Rutland Regional's overall charge increase averaged just 1.8% per year, the third lowest average of all the hospitals in Vermont. We have been sensitive to the impact of hospital rate increases on our patients, our local businesses, our schools, and the, municip and the municip municipal entities that provide health insurance to their employers. And despite these financial challenges, we have committed to advance our health care payment and delivery reform efforts to support the goals of the Vermont all payer model by assuming additional financial risk through agreeing to enter into the Medicare program under the One Care Accountable Care Organization. Rutland Regional submitted a budget request that included a 6% overall charge increase. On September 16th, the, the board voted to approve our requested 6% rate increase. However, this was uh, quote separated as a 4% standard increase and a 2% COVID rate increase. We feel that the 6% rate increase is what we need to legitimately operate the hospital over the coming year, irrespective of what happens with COVID. For this reason, we did not designate or request any of this rate increase as COVID related. If we suffer another shutdown of elective procedures or a surge of uh, critically ill uh, acute COVID patients, all bets are off. A 2% rate increase will not mitigate this impact. We are further concerned that there has been no definition of what a COVID rate increase means. This new ambiguous provision introduces much more uncertainty that may result in significant consequences to our hospital and the patients we serve. One of these ramifications is that by characterizing part of the rate increase as COVID related, this may be considered by the federal government as COVID relief funds that will result in the federal government clawing back some of these federal relief funds that Rutland Regional has received. Another potential consequence is that Rutland Regional, we believe we've exhausted our ability to reduce expenses and not impact clinical quality. Further expense reductions at Rutland Regional will likely have to come through the form of elimination of certain programs and services. Over the past several years, we have seen hospitals throughout our region and our state take measures such as closing intensive care units, and eliminating critically important 
but costly services like obstetrics. While this may appear to be beneficial by allowing the affected hospitals to reduce their net patient revenues, they only shift these costs to other hospitals, since these patients ultimately do get admitted to other ICUs and these babies do get delivered somewhere. So the end result is some hospitals look good, while others take on additional volumes of services that increase their net patient revenues, but require disproportionately greater expenses to be added to safely uh, provide this additional care. And some of this care has, and may continue to leave the state, thereby exporting Vermont healthcare dollars, which don't go seen, but ultimately result in higher costs for Vermonters. I'd also like to state that there are many, many more factors that influence the total cost of healthcare and the cost increases to our patients than simply hospital rate increases. Utilization, plan benefit design, patient out-of-pocket cost sharing per percentages, post-acute care utilization, the healthcare labor market, drug cost increases, availability of primary care, the cost shift, state and federal regulatory mandates, the malpractice environment, the effectiveness of care coordination, the availability of mental health services are just a few of the numerous drivers of the cost of care. I believe that the almost singular focus on net patient revenue and the reliance on hospital rates as the primary tool to adjust net patient revenue has uh, exhausted its utility and is beginning to impact the effective and efficient operation of our hospitals. Listen, we don't want to be arguing balls and strikes with our regulator. I believe we can work together to develop a broader and more comprehensive understanding of these cost drivers and to develop a more cost-effective way to direct and incentivize hospitals to address these. In the meantime, we respectfully request your reconsideration of the bifurcated rate decision for Rutland Regional and to approve our 6% rate increase as requested. I want to thank you for your consideration and opportunity to address you. Thank you, Claudio. All other members of the public? Uh, can I make a comment, Kevin? You can, Ham. Um, State your name for the record. Um, my name is Hamilton Davis, um, and I write about health care and health care reform. Um, my, my, my question is, I'm just looking at this, and I've, I've seen, you know, I've been watching these kind of hearings since 1980, and, the, uh, and it, what, what sounds like a, significantly a standoff, one of the questions is that the, one of the questions is that I have that I still don't understand is if the, if the board, let's say, call it, it's 50-50, whether the, whether the Green Mountain Care Board now votes um, to um, vote, to change, make the change that's been requested. I think the Claudio's uh, statement was powerful, but it's still 50-50 uh, based on Maureen's, uh, Maureen's position. Here's the question of Kevin that I would hope you would ask, Mr. Muller, I hope you would ask uh, Dr. Brunson. If the decision, if the board decides to stay with the current budget, what would your response be? So, Ham, it's a somewhat confusing question because Dr. Brumstead hasn't asked to um, have a reconsideration on the rate for UVM Burlington, only for Porter. He's just asking that the, the bifurcation of the rates um, be eliminated. Well, I, I don't know how to, I don't know that I don't know really how to reframe my question, but I think the question is obviously present implicitly. If the um, the what what Brumstead has said in several several different ways, okay, is that he believes that his or his organization, the, the Medical Center Hospital of Vermont, mainly, okay, uh, is 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 progressively getting less able to deal to do the things that it thinks it ought to do. It ought to do. If the if the so my question is, it, given the given that fact, okay. What will he do if he does if he's not happy with what whatever decision you make? I think that's a perfectly fair question. 
Well, Pam, you know, it's this is public comment. We don't uh, allow the public to interrogate the uh, witnesses. Um, and again, I'll just reiterate that Dr. Brum said did not in his letter ask to have the rate increased for UVM Burlington. Is there other members of the public in, in, in him? We want you to be able to have a Thanksgiving yeah. and a Christmas celebration. Well, the governor wants to too. I, he was on my side, you know, Kevin. <laughs> For those who were not watching, uh, Ham asked the governor a question during the the uh, press conference today, and uh, you could see the passion in Ham's uh, question that he really would like to see his family at the holidays. Thanks, Kevin. Other members of the public. If not, uh, at this time, does any board member wish to make any particular motion? And I will restate the fact that um, there are uh, there was one letter, but there were three different motions that were made um, during the budget process. And I believe that um, each of those motions would have to be considered separately. And because of that, um, I would have to disqualify myself from the ability to make any motion on Porter as I did not vote in the majority. And Member Pellum would have to disqualify himself from making any motion um, as it relates to UVM as he was not a member of the majority in that vote. But with that being said, once a motion is made, um, all will be entitled to vote. Do I have that correct, Councillor Barber? Yes. Thank you. And Kevin, so, I just wanted to make another comment, if that's OK. Go ahead, Maureen. Um, something that I prepared, but partially related to what, what Ham said. Um, and you know, I haven't given away what I'm going to, to do at the end. I just wanted to really kind of set the stage for um, talking about the letter that we received um, and discussing a few of the things in there before we move forward. And then, you know, I kind of need to just put that out there because we did get a letter that was, I would say on the border of being relatively accusatory to the board of us not doing our job and not use, using the benchmarks and things like that. So I just want to kind of go through a little bit of that first. Specifically, what the letter said was on an annual basis, the board establishes benchmarks for any indicators for use in developing and preparing the upcoming Maureen, fiscal year budget. Maureen? Yes. All right, this is Joanne, the yep. board reporter, and that's too fast, please. Could you slow down and start again? Sure. Thank on you. an annual basis, the board establishes benchmarks for any indicators for use in developing and preparing the upcoming fiscal year budget. Hospitals then build their budgets and manage their operations with those guidelines and benchmarks in mind. The board is required to approve or adjust the hospital budgets by reference to the guidelines and benchmarks it established in advance. This year's budget process did not comply, I'm reading from the letter, with the GMC's own rules. It adjusted our budgets based on guidelines and benchmarks that it never articulated prior to its deliberations. I specifically want to talk about UVM and CVMC. Um, respectfully, as UVM states, the board can impose restrictions on various indicators, for example, rate increases, yet the board chose only to provide guidance on NPR. I believe this gives the board flexibility to approve rate increases based on specific hospital circumstances and by no means restricts the ability to adjust this request. Yet we did set one metric. We set 3.5% over prior year for NPR. And when we review the three network hospitals, in the letter from UVM, it states the board did not abide by the benchmarks and guidelines that we set. It seems in a way it was to our benefit that we did not. Had we abided by that, UVMC requested 5.7%. In order to reduce UVMCs to the 3.5% benchmark that they were supposed to be moving towards, um, that would be a reduction of, from their 8% commercial rate to 1.2% we ended up approving a 4% commercial rate with a 2% additional rate because of the circumstances that we're in due to the pandemic. 
actually in the past four, five years, their average rate is three and a half percent. So the 4% was kind of a, a, a maybe ceiling of what we were looking at for almost all of the hospitals, um, excluding North, Northwestern. Um, if we did, and then again, I, I think I mentioned this before, but to put into context, their request was $77 million increase or the 5.7%. And of that 38 million was the rate increase alone. And when we looked at their expenses, their expenses went up by 125 million. So, so there's definitely one of the things I've pushed year over year is cost savings and metrics. And we hear that we are working on them and that you have them in there, but they're not keeping up with the pace of the expense growth. On CVMC, their request was 8.7%. And in order to reduce to a three and a half percent benchmark, using the only lever we really have right now, which is commercial rate, they'd have to have a negative commercial rate in order to meet that. So respectfully, I just want to say we did use the benchmarks that we set. Uh, the network didn't necessarily use the benchmarks that we set, and we're in unprecedented times. So I understand that there may be need to be accommodations made, which we did do. Um, and I am open to the discussion that we're going to talk about now. But I just want to make sure, because there's been a lot of press about what this board has done to the network hospitals, and that we didn't use the process. And in fact, we did use the process. And we, we did use the one benchmark that we set. It may mean in the future that you're asking for us to make more benchmarks, to have more benchmarks out there so that we can can be measuring against that. And that's something, quite frankly, there has been some resistance to because we didn't want to just get locked in necessarily to the rate, but maybe that's what we do need to do in the future. So I just wanted to make sure, I felt it was important because I felt the letter that we received was unfair and as far as some of the statements it made about the board and our process and being untethered and other things. So just want to make sure that I'm on the record of saying I don't believe that was true. Um, we do our best as we're going through this as well and balancing not just the hospital requests, but what it means for consumers who are using the services and the affordability and accessibility as well. So before we move forward, I just wanted to make sure we got some input on that as well because what's being written is is not supporting what actually happened in the process kevin this is robin um i'm i'm happy to make motions um but before we do that i wanted to also just make a statement about the hersa guidance um because i that way if folks had a reaction or wanted to comment i was hoping that we'd be able to allow for that is that okay it is. All right. So uh, I did review the HRSA guidance that was received, and I don't disagree with Jeff's characterization of uh, it, there needing to be additional um, information and clarification from HRSA in terms of how they're going to react to it. And certainly, uh, it can be quite difficult to understand how a federal agency is going to react to something that occurs at the state level. So. Um, but with that said, I did just want to clarify that what we are approving is a maximum change in charge and a max or a maximum commercial effective rate. Uh, it is not the actual reimbursement rate. Uh, that reimbursement rate is calculated or negotiated between the commercial insurer and the hospital individually. So, um, and in addition, while I can certainly see why there was some confusion because of the guidance related to the uh, temporary rate increase, and I, and I agree that perhaps characterizing it as a COVID uh, rate increase, increase uh, would, would make sense not to do that, but to, because really it's a temporary, we characterized it in our hearing and our discussion as a temporary rate increase. Um, I do think that in uh, written orders, those factors can be clarified to be clear that this is a maximum, that um, it is not based on actual expenses related to COVID. Um, and while some of the hospitals made projections to tie their rate, their temporary rate to potential uh, expenses expected in 2021 related to COVID, 
we did not necessarily use that justification in approving um, the rate. So I think when we were talking about the temporary rate, uh, the way we were looking at it, quite frankly, is that it provides us a way to ensure additional hospital sustainability in a very unprecedented time, which quite frankly is what the hospitals asked for. If we were to pursue our rate increases as we normally would, I think hospitals would be looking at getting the standard rate that we approved. So providing for some additional commercial rate to protect the hospital in an unprecedented time certainly makes sense to me. I'm not necessarily, and we can get into the discussion about, you know, whether it should be bifurcated or not. In reality, the way it would work in the commercial contract is that it would be a rate that was agreed to for the year. Um, but I just wanted to clarify that so that we had on the record that the temporary rate increase was not related to the types of expenses or calculations that are included in the HRSA guidance, at least in my review of that guidance. Thank you, Robin. Your comments are, are similar to some that I had as well in that I think that uh, the guidance, although um, well-intended from HRSA, uh, can be interpreted in a number of different ways. And um, I would submit that it could be interpreted that even if it was called a COVID rate, that um, it still could be argued that it's not a, a reason for a clawback. But because of the fact that I would be diametrically opposed to trying to um, place any possible clawback on the backs of just a small subset of Vermonters, which is the commercial market, I would be in favor, and, and as you know, the chair doesn't make motions usually. Um, I'm not prohibited from it, but um, I'm, I'm not uh, at this point going to make a motion, but um, my preference would be to take any conversation off the table and eliminate even the uh, um, conversation of a bifurcated rate and have a single rate and that would be for all hospitals in the state of Vermont um, that um, receive those decisions and it's simply based on the simple fact that we would never want to subject a small subset of Vermont which is commercial rate payers to footing the bill and um, that that's where my position lies but that's just one board member. Well, I'll jump in here since I haven't said very much. Oh, Maureen, did you want to go? You can go. Okay. Uh, I'm not sure the process here. Kevin, do we need to have a motion to reconsider first? Uh, if we do, I would certainly support one. I think we have to keep an open mind. And if we've missed something or made a decision that has unforeseen consequences, we need to reconsider our decision. So first of all, I would support a motion to reconsider just to have uh, a, the debate. But secondly, at least with regard to the bifurcated rate, I would support rolling the bifurcated rates into one year long rate, one, to protect federal dollars, two, to reduce uncertainty, and three, to give hospitals the confidence to make investments throughout the full year, knowing that they will have that rate for the full year. I think we can think about and we should talk about what we do at year end and how we um, address that. But at the very least, I would support rolling the bifurcated rates into one year long rate. And I think as part of that motion, it might be um, very important to um, also um, remove the enforcement section of this year's guidance, which refers to that, and go back to uh, you know the rules that are in place for the Green Mountain Care Board. And we could call a hospital in at any time if they were, you know, taking off like a rocket ship and blowing their um, NPR and and uh, just uh, going way off the. Uh, the uh, playing field of the budget, so. So maybe before we have more discussion, I should make a motion related specifically to the reconsideration because before we substantively discuss the the grant the grounds for and what we are reconsidering, first we have to uh, agree that we would reconsider it all. So does that make sense for me to proceed with, Kevin? Yes, and I'll ask Councillor Barber, is it better to address the two specific requests from the network separately from um, the broader requests of all hospitals, or could it could that one be rolled into one motion? I'm 
I'm not sure that there's a legal answer to your question. It, it could all be rolled into one motion if it's going to apply across the board to all hospitals the same. Um, but I think maybe the the wiser thing to do would be to um, address the re request that's before you from the network on those two issues and maybe separate those out and then based on the discussion and what you end up doing consider uh whether there's an extension to other hospitals that would be appropriate so now knowing how wise robin is i'll turn it back to her for um what she wishes to make for a motion okay so the first motion would be to um uh, it, uh, so I would move that the board reconsider its September 16th, uh, 2020 vote to establish the, bu the budget of uh, the UVM uh, Medical Center, CVMC, and Order. Second. As I understand the, the motion, um, and both the, the maker and the seconder, as I understand it, had voted in the majority on all three of those motions. Um, so I think that your motion is proper to, to uh, reconsider each, but then under a reconsideration, I think you're going to have to focus to specific yes. decisions that were made. Yes, but we can't do that until we agree to reconsider. I didn't discuss this with Council Barber before, and Okay. Yeah, are there questions from other board members? Yes, I'm just wondering how uh, the focus on the three network hospitals um, relates to non-network hospitals that had uh, a COVID related rate increase. So it will uh, not. That'll have to be a separate motion um, later on in the meeting. Oh. Uh, but it okay. does affect the question of Councillor Barber, who um, did advise Robin that this was a legal motion, but also advised me that um, people who um, were not in the majority um, could not um, make the motion. Um, is it okay to do all three at once, Mike? I'm sorry, could you repeat the question? Is it okay to do all three network hospitals in one motion? Yes. To reconsider. I don't think it's improper. Okay. Yeah. Good. Good. Okay. All in favor. Pam, you're off mute. Pam, you can't do this. This is a legal proceeding. <laughs> if you could mute yourself, it would be greatly appreciated. <laughs> is there any further discussion from the board? If not, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed signify by saying nay. Let the record show it was unanimous decision to reconsider. With that, um, would someone wish to make a motion about reconsidering a specific motion? Yes. So uh, I am actually going to start um, with Porter because I think that's a different question. Um, Uh, I think. Hold on. <laughs> so um, let me just back up. So I think now that we've moved to reconsider the budgets, that puts us back in the position of uh, discussing each of those budgets anew. So it's as though we never voted. Um, so it would be helpful for me if we could go to, thank you, the quarter live. Um, so, um, and could you go forward, please, to the slide uh, related to the 
decision. One more, thank you. Um, so uh, what I am gonna propose as my, as a motion related to Porter Medical Center is that um, we approve the request of a 2.7% NPR with a commercial effective rate of 4% um, subject to, uh, I'm, I, let me leave it at there for now and then come back to the enforcement question. I'll second that. It's been moved and seconded to um, approve Porter Medical Center's budget with a 2.7% um, change in NPR FPP and a 4% um, change in commercial effective rate. Did I summarize that correctly, Robin? Yes. With all the standard um, budget conditions? Yes. Thank you. Sorry, I forgot that part. Um, and if I might, I can speak to why I moved for that. You may. Okay. So, um, as I think I said during the Porter hearing, like the the issue around support of uh, a, the specific Helen Porter nursing home was really not my issue. Um, I think, you know, we typically allow for hospitals to manage to their budgets. Um, and certainly I think there, I was, I was uh, supportive of the idea that given that it's a 2.7% NPR requ request, I am willing to, um, to maintain that, that is under the guidance that we had set um, and in terms of the commercial effective rate, I think my intent in suggesting that is that uh, I do want to reduce the uncertainty related to the HRSA guidance, although I, I don't think it, this actually triggers it, but I do want to support the reduction of the uncertainty. Um, and um, I do think that during this unprecedented time, I understand why hospitals are assuming uh, more volatility and utilization and relying more heavily than in the past on their commercial rate requests, which I think you can see easily from the chart showing that the commercial rate requests this year were twice what they typically have been in the past. You don't have to move, Lori, it's okay. Um, as I was talking about generally. Um, with that said, I do think um, we also have to discuss when we get to the discuss discussion portion, um, how, whether and how uh, to review the commercial, the very high commercial requests this year, because in a normal year, I would not have voted to support more than 3% for this hospital. Okay, other board members, further discussion? Um, yeah, I yeah. want to throw out a, a potential concept and hang on there, fellas. But um, So I understand the need to look at one rate this year with, with some of the things that have come in recently, which, which what has already been discussed. So potentially eliminating the bifurcated rate, whether it's on this hospitals and other hospitals. But I also support what Robin just said, as far as kind of a, a normal rate, um, these, some of these rates at 6%, which we'll be looking at in the future, would be higher than I think that need to be, that we, I would have supported for a commercial rate. So to, we've also, um, it appeared to me from the letter from UVM, um, have been almost asked for giving out more benchmarks so that they have other benchmarks to, to measure against. Um, so one way to do that would be to incorporate a concept that would be in next year's budget guidance, but that would be looking at a two-year change in charge rate. 
and potentially having a guidance on a, on a two-year change in charge. So I'm just throwing out hypothetical here. But in that example, many of the hospitals were well under 4% for the rates that they requested and received this year. And they don't necessarily have the benefit now of coming back and getting this COVID rate and non-bifurcated rate if they didn't ask for it. Um, and next year, again, I'm just throwing up hypothetical, if 4% was, if we were gonna look for an average of 4% each year, then they could have 4% this year and 4% next year. Um, on a hospital that had six, it would be six this year, two next year. That would be our guidance, for example, if we, if we you know, accepted this path. I think it then gives the board the flexibility, it gives the hospitals the assurance that they're getting a rate this year. It gives the board flexibility during the process next year to review requests that may differ from that, just as we have done in NPR as a game example. Yeah. Whoever has music playing, if you could please mute yourself. It's probably someone at a hospital. Sounds like Muzak. So gonna, this is, is 447-5010. Okay, can you still hear me? We can hear you now. Thank you. Okay. So so the concept I think would would kind of give the assurances that the hospitals want this year. Um, and I understand why they why they need that going forward. But it would give us the flexibility next year to come up with a rate if we so desire to do it that way. Um, but I wanted to give the heads up for that, you know, at this point. And then just as I, I was saying, you know, when hospitals come in, um, we do consider what's going on with the hospital. That's why we differ from the three and a half percent rates, you know, barring what may be written about it sometimes, we do make those considerations. So, so it, next year when things come in, we would start with that position. Um, and then if there were variances from that, um, we would discuss it. And, and at that point, I think also to just ground ourselves again, the reason that we wanted to put in this incremental rate wasn't to punish the hospitals because we were taking it away. It was really trying to be what we thought would be helpful because of all the uncertainty, because there were incremental costs that specific hospitals have specifically lined out that are just related to what's going on with COVID because patients aren't coming back to the hospitals and, and we're seeing you know 90 to 95% utilization. We all hope that returns back in 2022. So, you know, just grounding ourselves on why did we even do this? That, that's why we did this, right? So at the end of this year or in the budget process, we're all gonna know a heck of a lot more. We're all gonna either be saying, you know, wow, we're through this, hospitals are, are back moving along as they had been in the past, or unfortunately we're in a worse predicament than we thought. We didn't get enough federal funds, people didn't come back, you know, and, and we'll have to make those accommodations at that time. So just wanted to put that out there because I think it gives some flexibility for what the intent was for this. And um, we certainly will have time to, to think about that um, versus just going with saying, okay, it's, you know, forget what everything we had set out to do, and we'll just approve all these as an ongoing measure. Um, so, just wanted to put that out for conversation. Other board discussion on the the uh, motion before us. Well, maybe um, I'll maybe address. Oh, go ahead, Tom. So, I mean, I I, I like what Maureen has said. I um, you know, the record will show that uh, when it came to a vote on Porter, that I explicitly excluded um, any impact on Helen Porter um, and, and explicitly said that's something that we have to deal with next year. What I liked about the COVID rate though is it, is it was a way to revisit um, budgets relative to potentially one-time expenditures that would roll out from COVID into 2021 but not continue on and so um, thinking about ratepayers, every every dollar counts or penny counts. Um, it might be good to revisit that, um, you know, in, in next year's budget process. 
but I, I can support the combining this into a single rate, especially since it adds, not doing it adds anxiety to the hospital budget process, you know, at, at, the, at the local level, um, and given this federal guidance and, you know, the accounting for it, et cetera, et cetera. But, um, you know, I do, whether it's, uh, and you know, think that some of this was, was not meant to be base building and that we shouldn't just assume now that that the combination of, of the 3% and 1% um, is necessarily base building. Other board discussion? Yeah, I yeah. guess so. I would certainly support rolling um, this bifurcated rate for Porter into a year long rate. As I said before, I support that for all the hospitals um, for the reasons I said. I do think, as Maureen and others have said, I think we need to make clear that we originally intended these supplementary rates to serve the need for, as Voss calls them, recovery budgets. That was our intent. Um, if we do roll the both rates into one, which I, as I said, I support, I think we should put more thought into our 2022 guidance around commercial rates. I think Maureen has one idea. There may be other ideas um, out there. I would hate to lock us into any particular one idea now, but I like Maureen's concept of thinking about what are benchmarks that we want to give more guidance, um, more transparency to our process. That was something that we heard from hospitals this year. So perhaps we generate some benchmarks that are tied, for example, to medical inflation, tied to recent race history, as Maureen has mentioned, tied to commercial to Medicare ratios, uh, tied to 2021 performance. So I think some guardrails would generate some more transparency in our process. And I do think in the 2022 budget process, we should plan to explicitly ask for the first nine months of 2021 budget performance to be more explicit in how we set um, or determine what commercial rate decisions might be for 2022. So I guess I would say, let's think about what our budget guidance looks like and allow ourselves some time to think about what we want might want that to to, to be um but i think some of maureen's ideas are good and we may have even better ideas as we as we get closer to the budget guidance but i do support uh rolling this rate into one i, I actually have to um make some comment though on the porter hospital budget because of some recent media reports I do feel it's important to address them, and I want to make it clear that I don't believe there was any intent to impede support for Helen Porter Nursing Home in our budget decision, nor do I think our budget decision prevents the full subsidization of Helen Porter Nursing Home, even with the small commercial rate reduction that was ordered by the board, Porter Hospital can still make the full $2 million distribution to Helen Porter and be left with almost $2 million in operating margin and $2.5 million in total margin. And that assumes they make no expense cuts. Uh, furthermore, even with the board's budget reduction and with full subsidization of Helen Porter, Porter Hospital still generates a higher operating margin on a percentage basis than almost every other hospital in Vermont. And I also just think it's important to note that the $486,000 cut that the board made to a $90 million budget was completely offset by the receipt of approximately $500,000 more in CRF funds than Porter Hospital was expecting. So I just want to say, to, to say that Green Mountain Care Board is putting Helen Porter at risk in its budget order, I, I find completely untrue. And I also just think for the public's benefit, it's important to know that Helen Porter Nursing Home is legally a separate entity from Porter Hospital. The Green Mountain Care Board doesn't regulate Helen Porter. We don't see the underlying finances of Helen Porter. We don't know payer mix, although we learned it today, 70% Medicaid. I think that's important. We don't set any reimbursement rates for Helen Porter. The Department of Aging and Living, um, independent living overseas nursing homes and diva sets those medicaid rates so if helen porter nursing home is losing millions each year it could be poor expense management it also could be poor reimbursement it could be both we don't know we don't we don't regulate either diva uh, to robin's point diva has processes by which medicaid reimbursements can be increased if the entity is struggling and it sounds like the entity is struggling if it's losing millions each year and i strongly encourage porter hospital to do all paths with diva to ensure the financial sustainability of helen porter i absolutely agree it's a treasured asset in the community and a path to sustainability should be found I just want to repeat, though, that in the Porter Hospital budget decision, the board did not eliminate the partial or even the full subsidization of Helen Porter Nursing Home. And like I said, the budget left Porter Hospital with a higher operating margin in percentage terms than almost any other hospital. 
We did limit Porter Hospital's ability to raise prices to individuals and businesses who have private health insurance and those who pay out of pocket for their health care services. We reduced the, the price requested price increase from 5.75 to 4. And I just want to note that that 4% rate increase exceeds what we learned in this hospital budget process, um, the estimate by most, ho most hospitals of medical inflation, including the network itself. In their own presentation, they had estimates of, of uh, medical inflation of between 2.2 and 3%. So that 4% exceeds medical inflation and certainly exceeds what most individuals can expect in salary growth this year. So when we're looking at hospital requests, we have to consider affordability, and we have to balance that with you know, the needs of the hospitals. And in this state where we have many, many people in our state have lost jobs, seen reduced hours, expect flat or even reduced salaries, and businesses desperately trying to keep employees on their payroll while their own businesses are suffering revenue shortfalls, we have to consider both of those things. So what I think is, is an interesting path forward put forth by Robin is if basically effectively we support uh, reinstating Porter's NPR to 2.7, but keeping the effective commercial rate at 4%, what that might allow Porter Hospital to do is to reach out to Medicaid, and to the extent that Medicaid reimbursements are not fully covering the cost of delivering care to Medicaid patients, whether it's in Helen Porter or whether it's in the hospital itself, I would encourage Porter Hospital to seek those higher reimbursements from DIVA for both entities. That actually would be consistent with the all-payer model, right, which holds that the state is harmless for total cost of care increases that stem from Medicaid rate increases. We are held harmful. We are held responsible for total cost of care increases that stem from commercial rate increases, but we're actually held harmless if they stem from Medicaid rate increases. That was to reduce the cost shift. So the all-payer model actually provides us a framework so that we don't need to use commercial rate all the time increases in commercial rate to solve for expense growth. So in other words, my final point here is if, if Porter can successfully seek Medicaid reimbursement rates that are higher and in so doing stay under the 3.5% growth cap, that would be consistent with both our guidance and the all-payer model and it wouldn't unfairly burden commercial rate payers. So I, in sum, would definitely support the motion at hand and I just wanted to clarify, I think, what I think the board's position was on Helen. Thank you. Other questions? Kevin, I would. This is Robin. Sorry, there's some. Go static. ahead. And Claude Deschamps, I believe that there's a, a buzzing sound coming from your. I think if you could be put on mute, please. Ah, great. Um, I wonder if before we move to a vote, we talk a little bit more about. Um, about the Maureen's idea of the guidance or your idea of um, on the enforcement, because I do think for me, it's less of an issue with Porter, but more of an issue with um, some of the other hospitals related to the temporary rate increase. I think as folks have, as Maureen and others have articulated, um, and quite frankly, as Dr. Brumstead articulated, the issue for me there is that it is compounding over time and it just does not feel fair to commercial ratepayers that uh, that addition, that this higher rate um, due to uncertainty would then be compounded indefinitely into their commercial premiums. So um, I'm not sure the best way to go about that, but I think it is important to make sure the hospitals have notice that we may go back and look at rates next year or, you know, who knows if it'll be next year. It is hard, I think, to be certain about it. I would personally not revisit it prior to a year um, because I do think what certainty we can provide is important, but obviously if we're still in a pandemic next year, let's hope not, but if we are, um, we may not want to revisit it. I guess well, what I'm Debbie to... Downer. sorry. <laughs> I don't mean to be a Debbie Downer. I'm just like I would like to assume that we won't be in a pandemic, but we don't know. And so that in and of itself makes it hard to be certain. 
So I guess what I'm trying to say is, like, I think it's important that we are clear whether or not we might revisit some portion of the approved commercial rate in the future. And I'd rather be clear now that that's a possibility than wait until we issue guidance in March, because I don't want to be accused next year of a bait and switch. Okay. Do you wish to amend your motion or is this in preparation for a future motion? I, I wanted to, I thought it, well, I can do it either way, but I wanted to talk more with, I think we need to have an idea of whether other folks are interested in that because I'm obviously just one. Yeah, and Robin, let me, um, um, I'll do one of my math examples just, just so we, we have, you know, what would happen in a given case, just, just so we can talk about it. And, you know, as the public knows, we can't do this before. So we, we haven't done, you know, we haven't all talked about whether we didn't want to do this. But take a $100 charge and assume there's a 6% increase this year, you get 106, right? Again, just doing math, assume for next year we were going to do a, a combined rate of, of eight and you, you did 2% on the 106, you end up with a rate of 108. Now I want to do the example a little bit differently, which is if we had given that hospital the 4% each year, it still works out to the same 108, you know, or like it's, it's marginally different, meaning if we said, okay, we, we're, we're giving you a 6% rate, only 4% is going to carry for the year, and then the next year you gave them another 4% in that argument. They, we still come up to the same place. So I just wanted to give you the math on that. So uh, the point of that would be then, if they get the permanent rate this year, in that example it was 6, and if we wanted to consider a, a two-year look, and we would have plenty of time to, to review what that would be and how we want to look at it, um, then then we would have that ability to make the next year's rate um, would, would form out by math, right? So if you had a 3% this year, and again, we said it was eight over two years, maybe next year you get to be five. If you had a 6% this year, next year you get to be two. Um, so it you know works out that they would would be in the same place, although higher one year than another year. So I don't know if that helps or not, but I just want to do the math part of it. If we, if you actually said, okay, at the end of this year, you have to reset and take away that, you know, two percent, and then work from there. The compounding still works pretty similarly; that it won't make that much of a difference. But my concept was really just trying to be creative in this situation that we're in right now where I think we want to give at least for the current year everyone would have the assurance that they have that rate for the whole year and that we've hopefully eliminated the issues that we potentially could have by having a bifurcated rate or maybe it would have you know qualified as additional funding for COVID and under the federal scheme so I think we've set that we haven't really finalized as Jess brought up there might be a variety of different things that we can look at that we've talked about before right the, the whole Medicaid to commercial reimbursement where do all the hospitals sit you know different you know and that's that's where one of part of our process is difficult because we set these rates across the board for everybody yet each hospital is different. And so we've tried to incorporate that into our process. And at times that gets looked at like we're, we're not using the benchmarks, but, but I think we are. We're trying to factor in what's happened, what's the financial health of the hospitals, you know, what are their um, other issues that they're facing, you know, what's their payer mix, a, a lot of different things, you know, so that we can be flexible there. But that, that's how that part would work. And again, it was, you know, we're not, I guess, determining that now, but it does make me more comfortable approving one rate with the understanding that I'm at least going to want to bring up something like this in the future when we look at next year and that we've now already started talking about that, you know, with the hospitals. Yeah, I guess I, I feel like I wouldn't want to put anything in set anything in stone because I think we don't have crystal balls and we can see what's happened in the last eight months that nobody could have predicted. We have no idea what's going to happen in the next next eight months. 
And I also think, to Maureen's point, every hospital is going to be in unique situation when we revisit their budget next year. And we have no idea what that situation is, is going to be. So I wouldn't want to stipulate anything in this motion about how we're going to treat commercial rates next year, other than to say, I think the board should have a conversation maybe in the next few weeks about, or you know, certainly as we're moving into thinking about 2022, about what kinds of things we might be looking at when we consider commercial rate. And I think we will always have the latitude to adjust commercial rates for the 2022 budget, looking at 2021's experience and looking at a whole list of factors that are unique to each hospital. So I don't think we are losing anything. We can always look and adjust. Um, but I think if we box ourselves in with this is what we're going to do next year, I, I don't want to do that because I don't have a crystal ball and I'm afraid that would be, you know, problematic. I'd rather give ourselves the full flexibility to look at all of the factors that are facing that hospital and make a decision then. But I do agree it would be helpful, I think, to the hospitals for them to understand what are the factors that we are looking at. You know, this is the first year we started asking questions about medical inflation. And what is your medical inflation? I think we can ask more explicit questions next year and have them calculate it rather than on the fly in a budget hearing in advance. I think we should be looking a little more closely at those commercial to Medicare ratios. Cost reports deliver information about charge markups. That would be helpful to look at. I think there's more work that we could do to understand prices um, and have a, a more informed decision making and, and have the hospitals understand what we are looking at, but I would put it in the guidance versus something now in a motion. So let me remind the board that the motion before us is to approve Porter Medical Center's budget with a 2.7% NPR FPP and a 4% uh, commercial effective rate along with the standard budget conditions. Is there further discussion? Councillor Barber, do I need to open uh, uh, this specific motion up to public comment or not? Yes, do. Hearing no more discussion from the board, is there any member of the public that wishes to offer comment on this particular motion only? Hearing none, going back to the board, um, is there any further discussion? Hearing none, uh, General Counsel Barber, if you could call the roll. Member Holmes? Yes. Member Yusufer? Yes. Member Pelham? Yes. Member Lunge? Yes. Mr. Chair? No. Okay, moving on. Um, let the record show that that was a four to one vote. Uh, moving on, would someone wish to make a motion on either Central Vermont or UVM Burlington? Sure. Lori, can you go to the CVMC decision page? Okay. I am going to move. Um, that we approve the Central Vermont Medical Center NPR FPP at 7.3% with a, wait, no, let me back up. I, I move that we approve the Central Vermont Medical Center's budget with an MPR FPP of 8.3% with an approved commercial effective rate of 7% and the standard budget conditions. I'll second. Okay. It's been moved and seconded to approve Central Vermont Medical Center's budget with a 8.3% NPR FPP and a 7% effective commercial rate with the standard budget um, conditions and um, commensurate reductions to expenses. Is that, was that part of that motion, Robin? Yes, yeah. sorry. Okay. Discussion from the board? If not, I'll open it up to public comment. 
Is there any public comment on the specific motion before us, which is for Central Vermont Medical Center? Hearing none, I'll go back to the board for any discussion. Hearing none, the motion before us is to approve Central Vermont Medical Center with an NPR FPP of 8.3%, a commercial effective rate of 7%, commensurate reductions in expenses, and subject to the standard budget conditions. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed signify by saying nay. Let the record show that it was unanimous decision. Moving on, does somebody from the board wish to make a uh, motion concerning University of Vermont Medical Center? I will move uh, to approve the UVM Medical Center uh, budget with an NPR FPP of 5% and an effective commercial rate of 6% with commensurate reductions to expenses and standard budget conditions. Is there a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded to approve the University of Vermont Medical Center's budget with a NPR FPP of 5%, uh, a commercial effective rate of 6%, commensurate reduction to expenses, and subject to the standard budget conditions. Is there discussion? Hearing none, I'm gonna open it up for public comment on the specific motion concerning the University of Vermont Medical Center. Is there any public comment on this motion? If not, uh, Council Barber, could you please call the roll? Member Pelham? Yes. Member Holmes? Yes. Member Lunge? Yes. Member Eastford? Yes. Mr. Chair? Yes. Um. Okay. So. Um, I think now um, I am going to move, I'm going to try to do this all as one motion, which may be crazy, um, but let me try. Uh, I am going to move that we reconsider the hospitals who we approved a temporary rate increase uh, reconsider the budgets of the hospitals, we approved a temporary rate increase, which include NVRH, Brattleboro Memorial Hospital, Mount Escutney, uh, NMC, Copley, R and RRMC, and that we approve those budgets uh, with the same NPR uh, increases as we approved prior and that we approve a total uh, commercial charge or rate increase um, as one unbifurcated rate. I'll second it. Well, Can Mike before just second weigh in? <laughs> before you <laughs> second it, <clears throat> would you consider, excuse me, would you consider um, amending the motion to not talk about uh, um, NPR, but just to reconsider the um, hospital budgets that uh, received a temporary piece and a standard piece to be one one piece so that we're not reconsidering anything other than that treatment uh mike all does other work? portions of their budget orders would be in order it's fine with me if mike thinks that works 
I mean, I think the legal question is whether we yeah. can partially reconsider the budget. And I'm not a parliamentarian. Like I, I, I don't see why you couldn't limit it like that if all the board members are in favor of that limitation. Um, but it's not something that I've <laughs> looked into, I guess. Um, so I, I yeah, I, it, I think I, it, it sounds like it's okay to me, um, based on the case law that you had uh, talked about previously. So I can let me reframe, let me withdraw the motion and reframe it. Before you do that, could I also point out one thing just to make sure that there is not an error? Rather yeah. than specifically naming them, could you just um, frame it in the form that hospitals that received a temporary and a standard piece? I I think you're right. I just don't want on the spur of the moment leave somebody out here. Yep. No, that's fine. I, I got the list from the budget team and Mike. Okay anticipating that we might do this because I didn't want to do it on the fly, but I'm, I'm happy to do it that way. So Kevin, I worry a little bit that it's kind of a, um, a, a doubling up for the, the network hospitals because we've already dealt with them. So um, th those would need to be separated out. We wouldn't want to have a revote on them in this motion, would we? No, I, I think the motion would be for other than the three network hospitals. Right. Okay, let me try again. <laughs> Thank you for your patience. Uh, I move that we reconsider um, the, uh, with. okay, let me start over. With the exception of the UVM network hospitals discussed today, I move we reconsider the hospital budgets for those for whom we approved a bifurcated rate and replace uh, the bifurcated rate with uh, a single rate. Okay, and uh, <laughs> I know you don't wish that you don't uh, relish the role of parliamentarian, um, Council Barber, but um, can this be done in one motion or does it have to be done in two first to reconsider and then to vote? Yeah, I, think just... it, I think it's reconsider and then vote based on okay. my research so far. Yep. Great. Okay. Let me. So the motion, to char. Oh, you, got, you got the motion right because you did say to reconsider. Okay. So, good. so your your motion is accurate. I did not hear a second. Second. Okay. The motion before us is to reconsider those hospitals, other than the three hospitals that are part of the UVM network that received a temporary as well as a standard rate increase, to treat their change in charge as one rate. Is there discussion from the board? Does anyone wish to make public comment on this particular motion? Hearing none, is there any further comment from any board member? If not, the motion before you is to reconsider those hospitals that are not part of the UVM network where that received a temporary rate increase in addition to the standard increase to have it be one change in charge. Is there any further discussion? If not, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed signify by saying nay. Let the record show that it was unanimous decision. Robin, your follow-up motion. Okay, so then I move that we approve uh, we approve the budgets of the. So let me back up. I move that we approve budgets for hospitals. Why don't you Why don't you move that you amend the budgets? Okay. I move that we amend the budgets of the hospitals 
that we had previously approved a bifurcated rate to set uh, a standard rate in the amounts that had been previously approved in total. Is there a second? Second. Is there board discussion? And we probably need to uh, say that that does not apply to the UVM hospitals, just to be clear. Correct. Hearing no board discussion, is there any member of the public who wishes to comment on the motion before us? Is there any further board discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed signify by saying nay. Let the record show that it was unanimous decision of the board. Is there any further business to come before the board? Chair Mullen, if I might. Yes, Dr. Bromstead. Um, I'd just like to thank the board for your willingness uh, to reconsider. I understand that this was uh, certainly not usual and customary, as I said up front, and experiences back to the 90s. This is the first time I've been involved in uh, any uh, reconsideration. Um, and so uh, I, we really appreciate that uh, flexibility. And I'd also like to speak directly to member Yusufer and um, colleague Claudio Fort's comments uh, and make it clear as it has been in the past uh, that despite my getting exercised today, we will be all in in collaborating with the board uh, and the board staff moving forward to uh, 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 make the process, improve the process as we go forward. So thank you very much. And on that note, there is a the hospital budget debrief meeting at the regular board meeting on October 7th. Um, Jeff Tiemann has accepted um, for the hospitals, and I believe Mike Fisher has accepted for the healthcare advocate. Um, but we'll, we'll be listening to anybody that has um, comments to make on the hospital budget debrief at the October 7th meeting. Um, I just want to remind the board that there has not been a motion today. I'm not suggesting there needs to be one, but I just want to remind you that you have not changed this year's enforcement policy. And um, that policy um, to, to remind people was only to have enforcement if for the two years, 20 and 21, um, the NPR was um, exceeded. So um, if you wish to have the ability to call somebody in mid-year, which are under the standard rules of the Green Mountain Care Board, it might be important to make that motion. So this is Robin, I'll just chime in. Uh, I personally think that the, the mid-year adjustments are, while not impossible, are tough, especially with the level of, of uncertainty. So just personally, I wouldn't, I'm not, I don't need to have the flexibility to call people in mid-year. I would, however, want to be clear, as was discussed earlier um, by both Maureen and Jess and I, that um, historical performance and projections for 21 would be considered in 22. And I think that we can clarify that in the guidance as was proposed earlier by Maureen and Jess moving forward. So that would be my take on it. Um, but obviously I'm open to other people's perspectives on that. I mean, Kevin, I, I know you say sometimes the chairman shouldn't make a motion, but you certainly can. Um, you know, I think it may give us flexibility, I think is what you're trying to do. It just, it doesn't mean we'll pull anybody in for enforcement, right? It's just saying um, it gives us flexibility to review um, mid-year, right? That is correct. It's part of our standard rule that gives us the ability at any time to call someone in. And I would just hate to um, 
have given up that opportunity given the enforcement that was uh, approved under different circumstances months ago. Um, and so, like Robin, I don't like mid-year adjustments, but I could, I could foresee a scenario where one could possibly be necessary. Obviously, um, nobody would like to go through that process, and I think it would be a worst case scenario, but I, I hate to tie our hands and take away our, our ability to do so. Wait, so do you want to make a motion? Uh, as the chair, I hate to make motions, but I will make a motion. Hopefully we'll get a second. I hate to be, be out there, but... Um, I'll second I, it. Well, first you ought to hear the motion. Yeah, well, I'll second it because all you do is discuss. It doesn't mean we vote for yeah. it, right? I, I would move to... Um, rescind the enforcement uh, policies as previously um, voted on by the Green Mountain Care Board and um, refer back to the rules that are in place for um, the possibility of um, enforcement. I'll second it. Board discussion? I, I, I can support that. I mean, it's it's an unknown either way, but it's it's just nice to have the option, as I say, to have the tool in the toolbox. Other board discussion? You know, I can also support that as well. I think it, it gives flexibility, and I think when you actually read some of the things about enforcement, I mean, it can go both ways, right? You can, you know, if the hospital was really not making their numbers, there could be adjustments made to rates to help or increase, you know, help get there versus the other side as well. So um, I think it just gives us flexibility. So I, I can support that as well. Can I ask a clarifying question, Kevin? This is Michael. Go ahead, Mike. Um, would it be to resend this and replace it with something else? Um, because one of the things that the, the guidance typically does is um, kind of defines what the board is going to consider substantial deviation from the budget uh, and kind of what they're going to look at. And um, so having no performance kind of in enforcement policy leaves that undefined um, and maybe so I'm just wondering, is is there going to be something uh, that's going to take its place, and when would that be kind of discussed? I, I think that uh, it would it would be wrong to create enforcement on the fly, and I don't want anything that would be um, create the ability for a willy nilly um, enforcement action, and I think it would take. Uh, much more um, time to consider, but I think we have time before we would even consider bringing someone in for enforcement action to have that discussion and, and allow the stakeholders to uh, participate as well. So at this point, I'm really looking just to rescind the enforcement action that has already been passed. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Is there further board discussion? I might have some additional comments, but I would be interested in hearing the public comment first. Yep, we always go back to the board after public comments. Anything else from the board before we go to public comment? If not, does any member of the public wish to comment on the motion? Hearing none, um, further discussion from the board? I guess I would say I'm... So why don't we go off and Yeah. Somebody trying to speak? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Um, 3730185, were you trying to offer public comment? 
Apparently not. So go ahead, Member Holmes. <laughs> I just wanted to say, I mean, I, I, I agree with both of you who I think said that mid-year adjustments are tough. Um, and so I, I would just say that if we are going to do, if we are going to rescind this, you know, enforcement action, I would really want to be very, very clear on what those parameters are that would bring, you know, a hospital in. And I agree with Maureen, it could be either up or down. I think people often think that it's punitive in the sense of, oh, they're going to, you know, if the hospital is running too hot, they're going to cut the rate mid-year, which I know is transactionally difficult for insurance companies and hospitals and all that. The flip side, though, is if a hospital is really struggling, um, it's it's possible to have, a, you know, a mid-year adjustment that might raise the rate. So it is symmetrical in both directions, but I would like to have a deeper conversation about what would constitute or trigger that, um, you know, reconsideration in the middle of a year. So I, I guess that means that we're going to have future conversation. Maybe it's on October 7th. I don't know. That may be the beginning. I don't think that it will be the end. <laughs> Other board members? So I, this is Robin. I think um, I, my hesitation is not because of the additional flexibility or concern about um, using that flexibility. My concern is with uh, modifying the guidance after approving the budgets. Um, I mean, the reason why we include it in the guidance is so that when people are submitting their budgets that they understand the rules of the game for enforcement up front. And so I'm not really comfortable changing it um, at this point. So I would just argue that uh, uh, the budget orders have not gone out. Hospitals ask for reconsideration on um, specific requests. And I think it would be much worse if we, after written budget orders, change the enforcement policy than before. Um, and that's why I see the uh, need for the motion today. Got it. Thank you for that explanation. Any further discussion? If not, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed signify by saying nay. Let the record show that it was unanimous decision. Is there anything further to come before the board? Um, I just want, so I think the other question I wanted to just check in on is I do think um, that the original extension of time provided for uh, the written orders to go out two weeks after decisions were made. Um, and I just wanted to check with Mike Barber on the record to see if his interpretation of that is that it would also apply to the uh, changes we made to the budgets today or whether we needed to further extend the time. Because I don't think it's realistic to think the staff should be able to yeah. Accommodate those changes. And I agree right completely, Robin, and this would be my interpretation, and Mike can tell me if I'm wrong, but I would think that um, the only hospitals that would be subject to the previous date would be those hospitals that received one rate and had no reconsideration at today's meeting, and that based on the previous vote, um, the it would be a two-week time period for the written decision for all those decisions that were made today, th those particular entities, with the realization that um, knowing Mike and his team, they're going to do them as, as rapidly as they can without making mistakes, and that it's it's not going to be dragged out. But that, that would be my interpretation of what's happening. But Mike, I really should be asking the lawyer. Yeah, I, so it's the board's interpretation um, or issue to interpret, but I, I think that is supported. Um, once you move to, or once you reconsider uh, a decision you've made, you kind of go back to before, uh, immediately before that decision was made. So like uh, for the hospitals that you didn't reconsider, 
uh, Friday, I think, was the the deadline. We're planning to meet that. Um, and for the hospitals that you did reconsider, uh, I think the final decision uh, votes for today. So um, two weeks from today, obviously, we can get those out sooner because we've been working on them. So um, that's all I have to say. So with that, Robin, do you feel the need for a motion? I do not. I just wanted to make sure it was clear both to us and to the stakeholders. Okay, very good. Clarity is always good. <laughs> is there any other business to come before the board? Hearing none, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded to adjourn. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed signify by saying nay. The meeting is adjourned. Have a great rest of the day, everyone.